Hello, hello, welcome to Quackalope. Thank you for being here. Today we're digging into Final Girl. And in fact, I just got done playing seven sessions of this game, going through the narrative storybook. So if you're a fan of Final Girl, if you're excited to see some gameplay content coming soon, go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. But in this video, we're going to talk about 10 rules you might be messing up, or 10 rules you might miss. I mean, the nature of this being a game that combines so many different stories and so many different factions and asymmetric abilities with your varying final girls, your varying locations, your varying creatures or monsters or hunters, there are some things that you really need to pay attention to and make sure that you're getting right to make the game balanced as you dig in. And this is a solo game, so that means until you start posting videos up online, very few people, uh, yourself especially, are going to catch the mistakes you're making. So this video should help you narrow down some of the things you might be overlooking throughout the course of gameplay and highlight some things that you need to keep in the front of your mind because they might not be quite as intuitive as some of the other card flow or processing. I have my handy note card here so I get them right because, you know, I don't want to do a list of top 10 things and not have, uh, not have them correct. So starting with number one, weapons can modify your retaliate card. That is going to be one of your bonus cards that you can pick up. It allows you to react to the monster, the hunter that's going to be attacking you, and your weapons can modify this, meaning that this is going to be a classic damage card, and if you successfully avoid damage or deal damage back to the creature, as long as your weapon card is, is within the standard rules, so that means the appropriate amount of range uh, and the appropriate type of weapon to modify, you will be able to use it with Retaliate, which means in some instances you'll be able to do a really powerful kind of take that action, which is really important. Number two, you can always discard one action card or multiple action cards for one time each. And this is so important for a game that is all about the balance of hand management and resource management as you're spending or utilizing your time to take actions and also turning that into the resource that you're buying your next cards with. If you need that one extra bump, instead of paying it to modify a dice roll, uh, why don't you go ahead and save that, pay it down, gain yourself a time, and maybe pick up a long rest card into your hand because you know you're going to survive at least through the next turn. Number three, victims killed equal bloodlust. Now, this is something that I had to check while I was playing, actually, and I decided to add it because it just seems like a note that some people would have. If you have anyone killed for any reason, the bloodlust track over here on your hunter is going to go up. Now, that means if they jump into the lake and drown, that means if birds fly out of the sky and peck their eyes out, that means if a truck drives down the road and just completely annihilates three of them, does not matter he is going to be uh, rewarded for whatever havoc reigns in the city. So, keep that in mind as you play. If a token is discarded, then the item card is useless. Now, the most direct reference I have to this is going to be something like the bear trap, for instance. You get the item card bear trap that's going to trigger you placing a token down on the board, but if that token, for some reason, is discarded, apologies, I think... I think I have something in my eye. Either way, we'll keep going. If that item card is discarded or that token is discarded, that item card is worthless. You can't use it to respawn or replace or redo another bear trap. That's going to be true for any item or token item relationship in your hand. You might as well just kind of let it go and discard it out of your hand at that point. Number uh, five, I believe. Actions must be resolved before anything else happens before they're interrupted. Now, what does that mean? If I'm taking an action like a move or a critical blow, I cannot then play a additional item or place a token down in the middle of that. If I'm sprinting across the board, I can't just drop something unless the rules on the card specifically say I can do that. Retaliate and guard would be a instance of a little bit of an interrupt when it comes to the hunter actually attacking you. But when it comes to your turn, I don't right now know of anything that breaks that standard rule. You must resolve every action individually and fully before you do something else. So if you're stopping to place a bear trap, you're stopping to place a bear trap. When the puppet is killed, uh, it goes to the exhausted space. Now this is going to be a specific one tied to, if I can find it here, the Carnival 
of blood, which is going to be the uh, scene box here. I cannot for the, pick it up. It's going to be tied to the scene box here and the hunter that comes with this scene, which is going to be our uh, clown. You can see him haunting in the back of this picture. Now, this was something that was omitted from the rule book, just forgot to be included. Uh, and it's a fairly simple thing, but just so you know, the official ruling is when a puppet, a little, uh, tiny little puppet, is murdered, it is going to go to the exhausted zone. Uh, which means it might come back, basically. Uh, maximum health is maximum health. What does that mean? Well, you can never heal above your maximum health. Now, remember, you do have these bonus tokens here, which might provide a little bit of support or a little bit of fluctuation to what your maximum health actually is, but they don't actually change what your, on your character card, maximum health is. You cannot heal above whatever this number is here on your board. So keep that in mind as you play. Uh, the final health token, which is the thing I was referencing here, this little doohickey with either 0, 2, 0, 1, or 2, or 3 hearts underneath it, that final health token for both yourself and the hunter is going to end the action phase immediately. It wipes it out entirely, which means whatever happened during that phase, for instance, if he was in the middle of attacking you and still had another attack to resolve, that's not going to happen. It's like you got stabbed to death, fell down on the ground, and then they walked away thinking that they'd finished the job, and then you gasp and like reach up through the gravel and you're still alive. So thematically, it makes sense. Mechanically, it makes sense because you don't carry over damage. So if you do take, let's say, three damage and that knocks you down to your final health token, that is where the damage limiter is, right? That's the, that's the damage point. You spawn back that amount of health. You trade this token for a little white token that pops down over here showing that you're at the last part of your health. And uh, you get one more chance at redemption or however many more turns you can squeeze in before the game comes to an end. At that point, unless it's you and the villain that are... Uh, have flipped their tokens, you're in a bad spot. Next, you're always going to target the victim over the final girl, unless the card says differently, right? So, here on your standard action for most of your hunters, it's going to show the victim and the final girl targeting symbol. That means that if you're in a spot with both the victim and the final girl, the victim is going to be the person that suffers the consequences. And in very few instances can you interrupt or save them if that's the case. So do your best to pull them out of harm's way, avoid where the villain or the hunter is, and uh, get them to an exit zone before he stops on your space. Because once again, you cannot do very much to save them. I mean, after all, you're the final girl. All the victims need to die before you suffer your mortal end. Which has been most of my experience in this game. Which. I'm fine with it. I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Uh, last one, before one little caveat, is going to be the fact that you have a hand size of 10 cards. Now, this oftentimes doesn't come into play, but if you, at some point, have so much time and you're refreshing all of your zero cost, you can never break the game by buying up everything or buying up all the low cost cards, right? You have a hand limit and you must stick to that hand limit throughout the course of the gameplay. So just double check. When you feel a, a hefty amount of cards in your hand, make sure that you're not exceeding the limit by one or two because that could have a big balance or a big swing on the balance of the game. And then the final thing, a thing that people are uh, terrified or scared to do, these flaps are made, for those of you that don't know, to go on the outside of the boxes. They're magnetic uh, so and they stick actually really well as long as you have the side correctly on. So it's not that side. Either way, these are made to go on the side of the boxes. They stick and hold together here. Now, if you have them on the side of the box, naturally this flap is supposed to go around the box. So when you play it down, it kind of feels like it's flipping up a little bit. Well, this binding here is made so that you can fully bend it back. Now don't do it aggressively. Be careful with your, with your games, of course, but it's not like the spine of a book. You can bend it back comfortably and you can have it lay down perfectly flat on the table in front of you. So you don't have to deal with the a kind of annoying little bit of a curve. They gave enough wiggle room to the sticker here uh, that it's got just enough flexibility. And I don't know if they have cloth or fabric or something, but they have something in here that means it's not going to tear and rip if you're trying to correct your uh, game state, just so it's not sitting like that all the time. And there you have it. That's going to be uh, 
my list of 10 rules you, you might be overlooking with Final Girl, let me know how many out of this list of 10 have you missed or, or were like eye-opening awakenings for you. Because the very first time I played, I, I'm going to be honest, I had to reread the rulebook and I caught five or six of these that I was just completely disregarding when I played. For instance, one of the silliest things that I did, which you might be doing as well, is I was assigning move value to locations that didn't have move value, right? I was targeting, moving, and then stabbing. And then it took about a game or so for me to realize that it doesn't work that way. If there's a target, that's just the target. Then the stab is just the stab. The only time they're actually gonna move across the board is when they're resolving a boot action or a move action. I am really enjoying Final Girl. I cannot wait for season two to actually get here and arrive. Like I said, we're doing gameplays on basically every single uh, subset and scenario here in the in, here in the game, every chapter one from this book of lore and mysteries, uh, kind of the campaign novel. So if you're enjoying that, if you're enjoying Final Girl, if you wanna see a whole like six part series of solo play where I get destroyed, stay tuned. Thanks for being here. Whatever the case, though, whatever you do, remember to do the important thing. Get out and play some games. I'll see you next time. Thank you.